Hello and welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna and that is Courtney. Hello. Every week we like to remind you before we get into our story of some of the things that you'll find in the show notes. You will always find links to the resources that we use to research each episode. So if you want to read some more articles, learn a little bit more and read up on the case, then you can check those out. We also have links to resources for things like domestic violence, anti-bullying, suicide hotlines, 12-step programs. If you or anybody you know needs those resources, we have those linked in the description as well. We also have links to our thread list where you can get merch like t-shirts and mugs, phone cases, tote bags, etc., And there's also links to our social media if you want to follow us and get uh, breaking true crime news, if you want to get updates on our new episodes coming out, and there's a ton of memes and interesting, funny info on our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter as well. And lastly, if you want to join our Patreon and get access to ad-free episodes and bonus episodes and a bunch of extra perks, you can join our Patreon, which is linked in the show notes. It's patreon.com slash murder dictionary podcast. So we want to say thank you to the new people that are on our Patreon this week. Thank you to Jennifer, Cheryl, Melanie, Casey, Meg, and Will. So thanks, guys. Thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. So I think that's pretty much it for announcements and show notes and stuff like that. We can get into our next case for Letter R, Railroad Killers. And we are talking today about the French train killer, a.k.a. the killer of the trains, a.k.a. Sid Ahmed Rizala. Yeah. And it's funny because they called him the killer of the trains, which implies trains break down, right? But no, (laughs) he's killing on the train. Right. Of course, I think there's a little bit of translation because the killer is French, so maybe there's a little bit of it makes more sense in French than it does when it's translated to English, possibly. I agree. There is that. So it's interesting to note that the French train system had 7.1 million annual passengers in the year 2000, but it increased to 16.5 million in 2017. So that's a huge jump in not that large of a time. I'm sure it's more now. And then I don't know. I mean, with COVID, maybe there hasn't been as much in the last year or two, but I mean, I'm sure that everything's different now. Exactly. There's a lot of people that are using the trains in France. So it's important to note that here in the US, trains are not a huge mode of transport, especially in these bigger cities like LA, we really don't use the trains very much. But no. in a place like this, you've got to assume that this killer is coming in contact with a lot of people, a lot of potential victims on a daily basis. Sid Ahmed Rizala was born in Elbar, Algeria on May 13th, 1979. His father, Jean-Michel Verne, was a mechanic, sometimes said a former policeman as well. So maybe he did one for a short period of time and the other the rest of his life. Not sure what order. Not sure. Because it would be interesting if he was a policeman first and then kicked out of the police. That would be... We don't know what happened there. Or Or if he was a mechanic and worked his way into being a officer. He could have been a mechanic at the police station. Right. But both things are mentioned, so we're not sure exactly the events or the details of that. That's correct. Sid had three siblings, and he did well in school while he was in Algeria, and he also was a little bit athletic. He enjoyed specifically playing basketball. 
There are some reports that in 1988, at nine years old, he was a victim of a gang rape by, quote, young people in his neighborhood. Of course, this is an older case. We don't really have a police report or anything like that. It's just something that comes up in the research that this may have happened to him. I imagine this is very traumatic for a nine-year-old boy. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's life-changing, just completely, unless you get a lot of therapy and a lot of help and you try and recover from this and your family supports you, it's really going to affect you forever. I assume that he really didn't get the proper treatment for it, you know? Yeah. In 1994, when Sid was 15, his family fled civil war and they moved across the Mediterranean Sea to the French port town of Marseille. Very soon after arriving in their new town, Sid started developing a bit of a rebellious streak and he was kind of slacking off in school. It was a notable difference once he, you know, traveled to a new place, he wasn't doing as well. Yes, they noticed it. It is mentioned multiple times that he just basically is on the decline as soon as they get into Marseille. Right. It was most likely a tough transition for him. And we don't know if maybe there was bullying because he was an outsider or if he was just having trouble adjusting to the new town or making new friends, whatever it was. But he completely dropped off of trying at school. And it should be noted, I guess, too, that Marseille has a very high African immigrant population just due to its proximity to Tunisia, Algeria, these countries. So it's a very large melting pot of all different cultures and community, you know, within African culture. But when you're in France, you're French. That's it. I <laughs> know it's true. Like they say this, that you are, what is it? I can't remember what the word is. I'm so sorry. I apologize. But you are not considered anything but French because they don't see color, basically. They don't see the race. They don't see your culture. They just see that you are in France. You are now French. Huh. I, I mean, I'm not aware of that. I mean, hopefully that would mean that his family was taken in and really welcomed in their new town. Yeah. But it sounds like he had the hardest time of any of his family members in transitioning to a new place. So while he was on this decline, he began cutting class. And while he was being truant, he started riding the trains. During the daytime, when he should have been in school, he began mixing in with drug dealers and petty criminals in the Marseille St. Charles train station. This was a particularly busy hub since it was the main train station in the area at the time. In February of 1995, just before his 16th birthday, Sid was arrested for raping a 13-year-old boy at knife point. It's a very violent attack for a 15-year-old kid. Yeah, I was going to say, that's just so young. And I know the abuse that he had suffered he's inflicting that on someone else and he's turning around and doing that to someone else but I just wish that he would have gotten that treatment and some sort of therapy to work through this and it really didn't have to go that way there's so many people that are go through trauma or are victims and don't end up taking that out on other people and he just was not one of those people it's just really sad and and he's so young to be doing that it's really scary you see when things like this happen at a young age it doesn't seem to get better very rarely do they just have this change of course right this is the age where people are doing things if they are someone that is violent and whatnot, they start doing things to hurt other people, to hurt animals, etc. And then it just progresses from there. So for this rape, he was tried and convicted in juvenile court, then sentenced to four years for the very violent attack. But he ended up only serving 
18 months before getting released at the end of 1996. I know that he is still young, he's still a teenager, but that's just such a short amount of time for a violent attack with a weapon, with a sexual assault component. I mean, that's really brutal. And that's not enough time. No matter what age you are, it's just, that's a lot. No, I agree. And there had to be some sort of therapy program or something that or, that he did really well in that they I would let hope him so out that early but I don't believe that I just no. don't yeah so in his file it's noted that Sid was quote a suffering adolescent there was clearly a lot going on with him and again he needed therapy he needed treatment he needed to work on his trauma but that was not happening clearly do you remember when you were in high school and you had your bad friends and your good friends, right? And I was <laughs> always like, my really good friend, she'll tell me now, I was her bad friend, right? So, but I really was a good kid. So the worst trouble I got into was like, not trouble, you know? But then me being the bad kid, there were other kids that to me, they were the bad kids, right? And those kids have like <laughs> done time. Those were kids that... Those were kids that were stealing cars, you know, like they had yeah. officers to report to, things like that, okay? Those kids are the kids that keep you straight. And if you have kids, you always just want to make sure that your kid's worst influence is actually a good kid. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that way, that's parenting from beyond. That's manipulative to an end, if you can just make sure that the bad kid isn't that bad of a kid, but your kid thinks they're terrible. Oh, <laughs> are you kidding me? That's, I just solved it. My God, I really wish I'd, oh man, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Yeah, there's definitely levels to kids acting out at this age, you yes. know, and there's kids that for them acting out is just not doing homework one day. That's the kid that cries when they get a B, you know? Yeah. And then there's kids that they're stoners once in a while. And, and to some kids, they're the bad kids. And like you said, there's other kids that are significantly getting in trouble. And like this example, exactly, there's kids that are so severely hurting and having outbursts and struggling with things that they are actually violent or committing crimes or whatnot. And definitely Sid was that category. He wasn't just like kind of a bad kid. He was really, really suffering and struggling and taking it out on people. And he had a violent streak and definitely was struggling with some mental issues that he was taking out on other people. Paperwork throughout his incarceration shows that he had many outbursts where he destroyed his cell and that he had seizures which worried their social workers. That alone is just, yeah, you should be worried. And there should be a lot, you know, going with this you know, seizure medications, maybe some, you know, therapy obviously would be great, but just finding a seizure medication that doesn't, you know, make him, you know, just uh, all this stuff. I, yeah, he's, he's really struggling with a lot of different, like, concurrent issues, you know, yes. and uh, clearly doesn't have the resources or the treatment that he needs. Yeah. Once he was released, he went right back to hanging out at the train station and, of course, committing crimes. He was fined 42 times for refusing to pay his train fare and had also begun selling weed on the trains out of his backpack. The list of petty crimes Sid committed, like pickpocketing and various theft like that, is very extensive. In addition to the petty crimes, he also had 14 more convictions for violent crimes. He's still able to just be wandering around with such a record. 
but that's young. what I'm saying. I mean, really, and we've talked about this before on Murder Dictionary about how incarcerating young kids and having juvenile facilities for long term can really end up being harmful for them. But in a case like this, where he's at this young age, a repeat violent offender, not just being sent to juvie for cutting class or running away or not listening to his parents, but actually pulling knives on people, committing assaults, committing sexual assaults. This is someone that needs to be rehabilitated. They need very intense attention to treat this. It's just not okay for him to keep having these violent offenses and then being sent back out on the street because we know that this is going to be an escalation. It's not going to get better until someone really works with him and finds, like you said, the right medication for seizures, maybe medication for his mental health, definitely treatment for mental health, trauma treatment, all these things. Otherwise, he's just going to keep getting worse and escalating to bigger and more violent crimes, period. In 1997, while he was still only a teenager, he was arrested for a stabbing on the train. Sid was constantly in trouble with the law, but between jail stints, he worked as an apprentice baker. In 1997, he met a girl named Nadia who became his girlfriend. Nadia had a son from a previous relationship who Sid became kind of a father figure to, and in turn, the boy called Sid daddy. Early in their relationship, Nadia actually got pregnant, and soon they had a daughter, Sarah, who ended up living with her mother in Armines, France. That same year, in 1998, he pulled a knife on a French railway employee and was sent to the, quote, Young Offenders Institution at Louaines near Aix-en-Provence. While awaiting trial, several fellow inmates made complaints about Sid sexually abusing them. We hear this so much with him. Like, it's not, there's always this, like, violent element to sexual relations, right? There's always some sort of really violent, like, usually with a knife, too. He just attacks. I was about to say the exact same thing. This is becoming a pattern for him, that he's he's a repeat violent sexual offender. Yeah. He was released on June 29th, 1999, at 20 years old. When he returned home from jail, he discovered that Nadia had moved into an attic apartment with a new boyfriend. He told her that if she left him, he'd go crazy, and he just would not accept it. At first, she was very hesitant to get back together with him, especially when she found out that he had actually raped a fellow inmate while incarcerated. Yeah, that would be an especially. Yeah, it's kind of a a red flag, right? Yeah. avoid that person. Any kind (sighs) of assault. That you've committed, (laughs) you know, I mean, uh, I'm rethinking my decision. Right. I, I can't believe this. But soon after he came home, she broke up with her new boyfriend to get back together with Sid. And who knows, maybe the new boyfriend was a piece of shit. But I mean, come on, don't get back together with Sid. He's a repeat violent sexual offender, you know? What do you mean, Brandon's a bad boy? Oh, my God, it's ridiculous. I just, it's I know. it's so sad. And they With have kids. kids. That's yeah. the thing, is mm-hmm. bringing the kids into this situation. It just is infuriating and tragic and just makes me very mad that she would make that decision. And you have a son from a previous relationship who's his stepchild. 
Oh, it's baby, whatever, you know, they're not married, but you're living as this kid's stepfather. He's calling you daddy. And now you as a mother have this information and you know this now. And you do know also that, you know, all these other, the attacks when he was 15 and all this stuff, you're responsible to your kid. Like you have to be there to protect your child. I personally, I think maybe just so I can get through this. I like to believe in my head that she did it because she was just terrified of Sid. You know, if you don't get back together with me, I won't accept it. So you get back together with him, right? Until you can figure something out. Maybe she was afraid. Right. That she was worried, maybe. Yes. We could conceive possibly that she was concerned that he would do something drastic if she didn't comply. Yeah. And she was just trying to get through the time being to where she could maybe get more stable and get out. I don't know. That's what I hope. But it is just very disappointing and sad that she would get back together with him and then subject the kids to his violence and instability and who knows what else was going on in the house, you know? Yeah. When you place a wager with William Hill Sportsbook, every sports moment becomes even more interesting. And we have a special offer to help you bet on all your favorite sports risk-free. Download the William Hill mobile app. And when you sign up, you can get started with a risk-free bet of up to $500. Use promo code RADIORF. Must be present in New Jersey. 21 plus only. Terms and conditions apply. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit 800gambler.org. Let's make it interesting with William Hill Sportsbook. At NJM Insurance, making our customers happy is what makes us number one. J.D. Power ranked us first in the nation for customer satisfaction with the auto insurance claims experience. Get award-winning service at NJM.com. This isn't just insurance. It's NJM. So they moved back in together, and Sid was often seen taking his baby Sarah out for walks around the neighborhood in the morning. One neighbor said that he listened to Arabic music really loud, but said that he didn't mind. It seems like otherwise they weren't really disturbing or loud neighbors or anything like that. Nothing like the mariachi band that I live next door to. Oh, nothing like it, huh? (laughs) You know, it's rude of them to practice, though, every Sunday and not offer you tacos or, you know, whatever they've got going on because it's a party every week. (laughs) yeah I feel like I should be getting something out of the deal (laughs) some sort of invitation I mean I hope you're just sitting on the porch listening now at this point just watching that would be amazing oh to live in southern California (laughs) right people don't know if you don't live here you'll just never know the fireworks and the noises and just so much going on all the time I heard fireworks tonight it was like 6 15 the sun was still out it was not even dark yet and I'm sitting here going what are they celebrating that's one of the most annoying things to me is when they do it while the sun's out it's not fun when someone lights fireworks at 1 a.m on a tuesday when there's no holiday that's not fun but it's even worse for some reason when it's just 4 p.m because i'm just like you can't even see them what are you doing with your life man you need to reevaluate some shit (laughs) There is a fun game, though, that you have to play if you live in Los Angeles and you hear fireworks. And the game goes like this. You sit in your home. You hear the fireworks. You could be anywhere. And you look at the person you're with and you go, was there a fight tonight? Was there a game? Was it baseball? Was it basketball? Was it football? Wait. Wait a minute. Was there a trial ending? What is it? You know? You never know what it is. What's going on that I don't know about? And then you get on and you go on your phone and you're like, what the hell? Oh, it's a fight. What's his face? One. Okay, cool. Dope. And we just keep going. And it's every single day. Welcome. It's fun. But don't those things just happen on the weekends? I don't understand the weekday things. I don't know, but it's Tuesday Anyway, I know it's a tangent. Six. I know, I know. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to go off into left field. But I mean, really, by all accounts, people said that they were just quiet, good neighbors. We live around some people that are just difficult and loud. But even though Sid had a lot of trouble when he was on the train and clearly in jail, he was 
definitely violent and disruptive and whatnot. But he seemed like when he got home, he had this boundary, right? Like he just wouldn't cross that line because he's, well, I don't want to create any problems where I live. He was an apprentice baker. Like (laughs) all I could think of was the intro to Beauty and the Beast, right? It's just that's what he was doing, right? That was his neighborhood. And maybe Nadia was Belle. And he was just walking the baby around in that lovely intro. But, yeah, nondescript. Yeah, he seemed to really just blend in as one of the neighbors, a father, nothing really to report there. The only thing that is suspect is that around this time, there were two other local rapes that went uninvestigated although he was kind of suspected, and one of which involved an underage girl. But locally around the neighborhood, people really didn't know that. It was just law enforcement that kind of knew to look out for this guy that had a long rap sheet. But everybody else perceived him as a normal neighborhood family guy. They always are. Of course. By the beginning of October, there was trouble in paradise, and Nadia broke up with Sid again. This time, of course, she said that it was for good. So he held it together for three and a half months, right? Like three months. And then something reared its ugly head, and she's done we often see that there's some sort of event that triggers this downward spiral. We see an escalation happening. There's these violent crimes, but then an event really kicks it into high gear to where someone crosses the boundaries and a person graduates from violent crimes to murder or from petty crimes to sexual assaults, whatever the case may be. And this was definitely the catalyst for some sort of breaking point for him. The loss of Nadia preceded his first murder by only a few days. And it really just must have been an event that pushed him over the edge. On October 13th, 1999, Sid crossed paths with a bright student named Isabel Peake. 20-year-old Isabel Peake was a straight-A student in her third year studying French and law at the University of Limoges with 23 other British students. On October 13th, Isabel boarded the 4421 train at the Limoge station in Paris, headed to Barliston in Staffordshire, new, near Birmingham, England. She had decided at the very last minute that she wanted to take a weekend trip back home just to visit her boyfriend because basically she missed him. She must have really missed this guy because this is quite a trip, by the way. The really? De- oh, my God. Just for a weekend? I didn't, I didn't map it. <laughs> oh. oh, my God. Okay. Trip requires taking an overnight train to Paris. And then oh, that's right. An early morning Eurostar. And you're still like just travel time. All of it. It's just travel time. Travel time. Is this like when Michael Scott said that he was going to go see Holly every weekend, but it turns out that it's like an entire 20 hour trip, basically? 100%. <laughs> Life is a highway, you know? I'm going to write it a million times. Every time I hear that song, by the way, I just look around for people and go, Do, do you know? Are, are you in the car there right now? Are you? Because I am. Wait, do you know this? No? Okay, that'll be 10 cents. Okay, well, do you know this one? Nobody knows. (laughs) Me and you know. Yeah, I mean, I guess I didn't really think about it, but it is a really long trip. So she's from Birmingham, England. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. I mean, she's in Limoges Station. Like she's she's going from Paris, you know, from France to England. 
But I mean, I think at some point it's just kind of priceless when you really miss someone or you're really homesick. Yeah. Okay. Just an hour, you Whoa. know. You know, I, w- I was just I'm talking playing. before recording about getting my vaccine just so I could hug my dad. You know what I mean? Like that kind of desperation of just wanting to feel like home. You know, I'm I'm assuming that that's what was going on with her is just ugh, I'm overwhelmed. School is crazy. I just want to see my boyfriend for a date and then I'll come back you know so it's just I don't know it makes kind of sense to me romanticized this so much because I was just like yeah I I guess you could say you travel far for some dick sometimes right when you're young (laughs) and you've got time or whatever and like this and that but well when you met my people and I want to hug someone and (laughs) <laughs> okay, we'll go with your side of it. We'll go with Well, because I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm kind of just, well, I'd travel a couple of days for a hug. But if I need some dick, I mean, you can get dick anywhere. You know, <laughs> like. <laughs> but a good hug. That's <laughs> but a good travel. hug. That's, you know, that, You're right. that's a lot. That's priceless. Nothing like a good shoulder cuddle. But give me five minutes and I, I, you know, I can scrounge up some dick. (laughs) I don't think it's that rare. That's all I'm saying. Medium rare. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, she had this little like last minute trip that was planned. I was going to say quick, but not quick. So she was catching this train early morning. The following evening at about 630 p.m., Cecile Brassad was walking on a road underneath the train tracks when she found what she thought at first looked like a dead animal. Once she got a little bit closer and inspected it further, Cecile realized that it was actually a mangled human body that was lying near the train tracks of the now closed Chabonnet station. When Isabel fell out of the train car, which was going 90 miles per hour, she landed on top of a pylon that broke her fall, ensuring her death. Even if the fall out of the train car hadn't killed her, the pylon was definitely the cause of death. It's rough. Yeah. It was brutal. Yeah. She was dressed only in a t-shirt and underwear and her watch was frozen at 4.20 a.m. Police suspected that she had been pushed out of the moving train after she had been sexually assaulted. But they initially wouldn't rule out death by misadventure or possibly even a suicide. It took some time to go through the computers for ticket receipts and surveillance footage before they could verify that the body was indeed that of Isabel Peak. Isabel's parents, Brian and Annie, alerted Interpol by reporting their daughter missing, and from there, the investigation began to really move forward. By the time the French police actually started their murder investigation, nine whole days had already passed. And we know that the first few hours and couple days are crucial in catching a killer. And the detectives had really missed out on this very precious window of time to gather evidence and build their case. Six miles from where she'd been found, a helicopter spotted her jacket and sweater lying next to the train tracks. Of course, from there, they continued searching along the train tracks more, and a few days later, about four miles further down the tracks, her purse and two pieces of luggage were found. Inside her purse was her ID, credit cards, and French francs she had withdrawn at the Limode station, which, of course, because they were still left in there, would rule out robbery as a motive. Yes, definitely. If you're going to rob this girl on the train, you're going to take the cash in her bag, right? You're going to take her bag. Yeah, and rifle through everything and take whatever you want or not leave her with a watch. There's so many things about this that point to robbery not at all being a factor. Yeah. When they found her belongings discarded, detectives ruled out 
accident or suicide and confirmed that Isabel had in fact been murdered. Because once you find her belongings in multiple places, it's not just like everything fell out with her at the first scene. We've got a purse and sweater and stuff like that. We've got luggage. We've got a couple different dump sites. We definitely know that a person was involved in getting rid of her belongings after she went out of the train. Definitely. When investigators interviewed witnesses, they recalled seeing a man in regular denim jeans with a baseball cap pulled down talking to Isabel on the train. In front of a large crowd, a reconstruction of the crime was done, and it was even directed by famed 007 and the Italian job stuntman Remy Julien. A dummy dressed like Isabel was forced out of the train car window. It bounced off the track, hit the side of the train, was decapitated, slammed into a post, and broke into pieces, falling only yards away from where Isabel's body had actually landed. It's a pretty awesome recreation that they figured out, you know, okay, this window, this timing, toss it now at 90 miles an hour. Right. They were really trying to recreate the whole scenario. Before police could make much headway in their investigation, Sid committed another murder only a couple weeks after killing Isabel. On October 29th, 20-year-old student Emily Bazin told some of her friends that she would meet them at a small gathering that they were having. One of her goals for meeting up with people this night was that so she was so she could pull aside her kind of on-again off-again boyfriend Thomas and officially break it off with him. When she did speak with him, he seemed disappointed, which was to be expected. But afterwards, they hugged each other, and the breakup seemed to kind of go well all in all, as far as breakups are concerned. Sure. It wasn't like he freaked out and there was this big blow up and there was this big public scene or anything. It was just kind of... Yeah, it's not working. Okay, I accept that. Let's hug it out. Go our separate ways, you know? Yeah. Thomas parted ways with the group afterwards, and Emily left to continue hanging out with her friends, Nicholas, and another guy she dated on and off, Sid Rizala, as we know, the French train killer. The next day, Emily's mother didn't hear from her, and she became pretty alarmed. This was very abnormal behavior for her. So her mother began calling her friends and asking around to see if they'd heard from her, but nobody had. Detectives pieced together the timeline of the night that she was last seen and they decided to bring Nicholas in for questioning, since he was one of the very last people to be seen with her. Nicholas said that he had parted ways with Sid and Emily at a nearby intersection in their neighborhood. Yet another witness came forward to tell police that the last time they had seen Emily alive was when she was waiting at a bus stop with Sid. Friends told detectives that they should possibly look at Emily's on-again, off-again boyfriend, Sid, since he was known to have a rap sheet. Yeah, everybody knew. Just, hey, you really need to look at this guy. Right. And these are the people that didn't even know she was hanging out with him that night. These are people that are just coming forward. Hey, I know her and she's been involved with this guy who's not so great. You should take a look at him. And I think that he'd been kind of playing Nadia and Emily, like at the same time together, Back you know, like forth. off each other. Because I think like he got with Nat with Nadia, they broke up, 
he's back with Emily, and then he, okay, he's, he goes in for, you know, the stabbing and all this, and then when he comes back out, when he's released in 99, he gets back with Nadia, and then Nadia breaks up with him, and then who's he with again? Emily. It's, come on, dude. It's the least of the awful things that he does, yes. but by normal people standards, <laughs> exactly. it is a shitty thing to do. <laughs> I'm so I'm over here just judging the hell out of him, dating two girls at the same time. What are you thinking? Oh my god, right? <laughs> I'm such a square. Get off my lawn. I I just kids today, you know. But yeah, I mean, it is seemingly something that he was doing, just kind of going back and forth. And if he had a falling out with one of them, he could go back to the other one. And if he had falling out with them, then he would come crawling back to the first one. It seems like that was what was going on. Yeah. Her friends also came forward to tell the police that while he was serving his sentence for the stabbing on the train... Emily had actually visited him in jail several times. It's so interesting to me because, again, like when he gets out, he goes straight to Nadia. Right. So is Emily just – he's bored? And so, oh, she's willing to visit me. It's its a visitor. You know what I mean? It's just int- – I don't know. It's bizarre. I'm sure we'll, we'll obviously never know. But it's just when you look at the way – like his interactions with these women and the timeline is what's interesting and where he is. It's just, I don't know. It just makes sense that he was going back and forth or that he just needed both of them to kind of keep him comfortable and sane while he was in jail, you know? Yeah. Who knows what was going on? Yeah. So police went to Sid's parents' house and they informed the officers that he had a new address because he was staying in an apartment with his girlfriend, Nadia. When the cops went to the address, they couldn't find Sid. On December 17th, two months after Emily's disappearance, police decided to search the building that Sid had been living in. They found it strange that the cellar door handle was broken off, the light bulbs were broken, and, of course, there was a foul odor that was coming from the cellar. They broke the door down, and they discovered Emily's decomposing body wrapped in a sheet and buried underneath a pile of coal in the cellar at the apartment house. It was no coincidence that the building Emily was found in was the same apartment building that Nadia lived in the attic apartment of. At some point, did he just hide Emily's body there, or did he bring Emily to that building and Nadia saw her and met her or knew her or were they friends was it a trio like it's it's very interesting I mean it's entirely speculation because we just don't know yeah what happened but we don't know was she killed at a different place and oh I have the purpose the perfect place to get rid of her body or was it like oh let's go hang out in the cellar because we can't go to my house because I live with this girl and they were just hanging out and that's where the murder happened. There's just a lot of different scenarios of what could have happened that night. Yeah. You know, the room that Sid rented on the first floor also had blood stains on the floor with long drips of blood spatter on the wall. The neighbor said that on October 29th, between 10 and 10 30 PM, They'd heard a woman's cry, followed by a heavy thud like something hitting the wall next door. An autopsy revealed that she had been strangled, and DNA from semen was found on her body. On December 13, 1999, Xavier Kello dropped off his wife, Corrine, and their four-year-old son and small dog at the train station, to board a train from Calais to Ventimiglia. Corrine worked in the medical field and was headed to stay with her mother in the south of France because she was having a throat operation. At 2.54 a.m., she was found dead, slumped on the floor of the train's bathroom, having been stabbed 13 times in a horrific bloody scene. 
Her throat had been slit, and there was really just blood everywhere in the train bathroom. I mean, those are small rooms, too, you know? Very intimate, very close up. And what's even worse to me is Corinne's four-year-old son was still asleep in his stroller next to her body. Just inhuman. It's unreal. Who can just leave this baby in a stroller with his dead mom in the bathroom on a train? Yeah. Just, mm. It's just so dark. It just baffles. It like this, blows yeah. my mind. This is the end. This is where it's just, okay, we're done with feeling bad for Sid. Oh, man. Everyone is the way they are for a reason. But this is just like despicable. Yeah, it's it's really horrific. Again, we see that his victim's purse and belongings were left behind and her wallet still contained money. So immediately the police could rule out robbery as a motive yet again. Detectives followed a blood trail on the door handle and armrest, eventually finding a blood-soaked baseball hat left behind by the killer. Two hours before the murder, on the same train... Sid had been caught for traveling without a ticket while wearing the same hat. Witnesses remembered him in the hat because he had been seen pacing and seemed restless. He was smoking joints as he wandered between the cars, so he definitely stood out to the other passengers, and they noted what he was looking like, what he was wearing, so people were easily able to identify him. DNA testing was done on the hairs and blood in the hat, with police anxiously awaiting with hope that they would find a match. To show you how easy it is to file a claim with GEICO, we hired sports commentator Dick Vitale. Tonight's matchup is me versus an ugly fender bender. If I can eat out a win, it would be a miracle, baby. Um, Mr. Vitale, it wouldn't be a miracle because GEICO gives you a team of experts to help manage your claim. That's going to be a nail biter. Nope. The GEICO team is there for you 24-7. Now that's a dipsy dude, the guru of a claims team. GEICO is awesome, baby, with a capital A. GEICO. Great service without all the drama. Welcome to Bob! What makes Moe's Moe's? Well, outside of our warm and unique welcome, some would say our burritos, like our legendary homewrecker. Others, our famous queso. Everyone would say our free chips and salsa, which are made fresh every day. Here at Moe's, it doesn't matter if you're a first-timer or long-timer. At Moe's, you're family. And when you're hungry and in a hurry, Moe's online ordering makes it easy. Order ahead through Moe's.com or the Moe's app and choose in-store pickup or delivery. But even though they suspected this man with the jeans and hat of this one crime, they really didn't connect it to the other murders on the trains. Each murder became its own investigation with full linkage blindness to the connections of the other women's killings being committed by the same murderer. There was such an extreme communication breakdown between different police precincts and also the railway officials that they missed many opportunities to catch him. For example, during the manhunt for Isabel's murder, train employees were told to keep an eye out for a man matching Sid's description riding the train without a ticket. Sid was even stopped one night around 11 p.m., And he gave his real name and his ID to officials, but no further actions were taken. He then went on to murder Kareen on that same train. Mm. Just can't get hands on this guy, you know? It's just a computer glitch again, as they call it. He's slipping through their fingers when it would be so easy They've given this description, look out for this guy, he's going to be riding trains without his tickets, stop him, get his info, question him, but no, they look him dead in the face, they see his ID, 
and they don't even bother following up. There's yeah. murders going on, multiple murders on these trains, and they really dropped the ball. Police interviewed his friends, and they said that they hadn't seen him since he'd let left to go get on the Marseille-Ventimiglia train, the one specifically that Corinne was murdered on. During the investigation, detectives found that there was record and surveillance video of Sid on the same trains on the same nights that both Isabel and Corinne were murdered. In another smooth move, the press was informed of Sid's identity before the police actually issued a search warrant for his parents' Marseille home, which then, of course, allowed Sid the time to flee to Portugal. A reporter arrived at his parents' house before the police even did, and his mother told them that he had just left. They majorly dropped the ball on this. Oh, the fact that the reporter got there before the police is just, I mean, come on, you can't write that. Yeah, it just boggles the mind. And then, of course, the reporter informed his parents that their son was wanted by the police because they believed that he was the infamous train killer. And there's no reason that they should be hearing that from a reporter, you know? It's just insane that they didn't get there before the press. The next day, an interview with Sid's parents was on the front page of the magazine France Soir. Yeah? Mm Mm-hmm. The article also detailed the ways that police had bungled the case, including the fact that the reporter himself had arrived before the police did. I love that this reporter wrote the article and included that. By the way, I was there before them, and I'm going to write all about it. Yeah, I would. I mean, we trust the police to do certain jobs. If they're not doing their job, I would say that that's the case. It's just the fucking truth. Yeah. Yeah. Wanted posters were put up on the walls throughout European train stations. Profilers became nervous in the days leading up to January 13, 2000. These profilers told police to expect a murder on that specific date since two of his murders had been on the 13th of the month and, on top of that, his birthday was May 13th. On January 7th, a friend of Sid's received a phone call from him, and she immediately gave police the phone number that he had called from. They were able to trace the phone number from the friend to Lisbon, Portugal. There was also a phone call from Sid to Nadia in Armenes, which the police were able to trace to a Portuguese phone booth. He's still calling her. Yeah, on the run. He's calling her from phone booths. And he's calling other girls. So now I'm just like, there's a third girl in play. What the hell is going on here? Well, yeah, of course he's calling everybody. What do you mean? But he's specifically (laughs) still calling Nadia. Right. Yeah. Investigators stationed plainclothes officers at the phone booth on the corner of Avenue of Freedom in Lisbon, Portugal, to do a 24-7 stakeout. But only after a brief wait, Sid arrived to make another phone call, and the officers appeared and took him into custody. As they were arresting him, he screamed, I am Hassan, but they know who I really am, before bursting into tears. That sounds like somebody who's really tired and just defeated. I mean, he knows the jig is up, right? Yeah. Like, he for, for a split second, he, you know, and then he goes, but they really know who I am. And he just starts crying. Yeah. I mean, that's just defeat. He's probably tired, too, you know, because that's one thing that we in true crime have learned is being on the run is an exhausting existence. It's very tiring. 
and it's hard to have your head on a swivel and to be that hypervigilance is exhausting. Yeah, it is, but I don't feel bad. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. He's a scumbag. Absolutely not. But yeah, he's terrible. But it seems like he had reached that point that a lot of killers reach where it's impossible to keep up with this yeah. lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Portuguese police said that they were glad French officers were there because he had cut his hair so they may not have recognized him. First thought here is, even if that's what they thought, why the hell would they admit that? That's just the same as being like, we're pretty incompetent, so thank God the real police showed up. Oh, you thank know? God you're here. Yeah, because, you know... <laughs> We've just got this two-bit operation going on here, and a haircut is a new identity. So right? thank God the French and police just, arrived in time. It's the same as Ted Bundy. It's just yes. like, how are people just not recognizing people because they have a mustache or a haircut or whatever it is? Oh, he's wearing funny glasses. I can't recognize him. I mean, come on. This is ridiculous. I don't know about a lot of these officers. Uh, you know, that makes yeah. no sense. It's just, it's, <laughs> it really is. Why would you admit that? It's great. Yeah, I just, I don't understand. I don't was... even understand it when people talk about Ted Bundy either. I'm like, it's yeah. the same person. What are you guys looking at that I'm not looking at? That's what kind of drugs were you taking at that year? You know, like. The fucking evidence room must have been raided because that is the same exact person, you idiots. Every time they show all the pictures of Ted Bundy, all the different, right? They're not that different. It's the same guy. And it's the exact same guy. I just, I, I don't know. I, I'm with you on this. I've always just kind of gone, all right, we'll go with it. Y'all didn't know who he was. Okay. But it, I have a hard time with it. You know, like really. But this one is, this is obviously some reporter ran up on this guy and was just like, hey, we need a quote, right? Give us anything. Well, we're so glad that the French police were here. You know what I mean? <laughs> like he was proud, <laughs> like under the gun, right? What do you think right. of this, sir? Microphone to the face. And this is, I'm just really glad France showed up. <laughs> right because he put eyeliner on as a mustache and yeah. uh, we didn't know who he was we thought it was john waters who knew <laughs> what do you mean john waters <laughs> is another corner avenue of freedom <laughs> yeah it's just ridiculous that they really had no faith in themselves that they thought they wouldn't recognize him and on top of that it wasn't just something they talked about in the station they straight up told the press I don't go around talking about my failings at my job, you know? Not not to the reporters, Brianna, please. <laughs> Absolutely not. If you make a mistake, you don't broadcast that shit. And especially in an industry where you are law enforcement, that people trust you, never, ever say that. Just don't. Well, it's interesting, too, because, you know, Madeline McCann is Portugal, you know? And they had an interesting relationship with the press as well during that yeah. case. So it is kind of interesting that they are not very well media trained. Let's put it that way. <laughs> that's a good way to put it. They should be. They need to go through the course. <laughs> but that's just shocking to me. Yeah, it is. Uh, to even have that trouble in identifying a person and then admit it, it's just a lot. That's just a uh, I don't get it. I don't understand. On the day the profilers had warned them of, which is January 13th, he was finally in custody at the prison hospital of Cassay. Sure. Sid's lawyers took advantage of the laws in Portugal that forbid extradition of suspects who risked a higher sentence than the maximum 25 years in jail mandated in Portugal. I got questions, Portugal. <laughs> this is another <laughs> one. Like, what the fuck? And I can understand there's definitely some studies and arguments against that long of incarceration. I mean, 25 years, it's it's a long time. And they aren't the only country where there's these maximums enforced, right? But the extradition part, you know, he's wanted for crimes in another country. It's just... 
Okay. Here's it's the difficult. Thing, though. He's wanted for crimes that they are the kind of thing that you don't want this going on in your town. In your country. You don't want this going. Get him out of here, right? So Right. It, you don't want him going to trial in Portugal no. and getting out in 10 years. Yes. And he's still very young by that time, and he's just going to commit more crimes. Yeah. So it's interesting. That was That's the only reason in this specific also. I'm just like, dude, send this guy. What are you talking about? Get him out of here. Yeah. You know? He's a repeat offender yeah. with just gnarly recidivism that just keeps violently attacking people and escalating to murder, more murder, more horrific crimes, more violence. You know, I mean, yeah. the scenes of the crimes even are getting worse. It's just clearly he's not going to just get better by going to jail for a couple of years. It was also discovered that a few weeks earlier, on December 18th, Sid had been arrested in Barcelona, Spain, for theft. This arrest happened only four days after Corrine's murder and him being identified as the suspect of the train killer. He was held in Spanish jail and released on December 24th since his name hadn't been connected with Interpol or under the search arrangements of the Schengen Treaty, which yeah. removed systematic checks at continental European borders. So basically, he slipped through the cracks because in Spanish jail... Nobody knew that he was wanted for these other crimes because there was no communication since this treaty had changed everything. Yeah. And then they just blame each other. French, right. You know, France says that you no, know, everyone was notified, including Spain. And then Spain is like, we didn't know. Why would we arrest him and then let him go if we knew? You know? Right. And it's just this funny little argument of, you know, throw it back at each other between France and Spain. But he's in Portugal. He yeah, I mean, they were arguing about it. It was going back and forth, and nobody could agree on what had happened. But the bottom line is, they didn't communicate, yeah. and he slipped through the cracks again. And he could have been out there committing more crimes. He could have hurt more people, killed more people, and it would have been the fault of every one of the authorities that didn't communicate. He was held in the psychiatric wing of a prison in Lisbon while French and Portuguese police were working on an extradition arrangement. French police also began looking into claims that Sid had actually been protected while he was on the run by his boyfriend, Armando Sanchez, who was a rich Spanish businessman who had plenty of money to help him flee the country. I wonder if Nadia and Emily know about Armando. <laughs> and this is the thing where I think he just needs to use people. Yes. I think that we're seeing a pattern here where he just wants to get what he can get out of these people, whether it's certain women that he wants sex from, certain people that he needs to take care of him as far as a place to live or money while he's on the run, or using people because he need to inflict violence on them, or this violent sexual gratification. I mean, he's just a user more than anything else. I think that the murders are an extension of him just seeing people as a means to an end for self-gratification. I think there's also... Maybe a component of, like, sex addiction here, too. Yeah, maybe. You know, just any way I can get it, I want it. Yeah, and we definitely know sexual assault is a lot about power, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he wasn't addicted to that sexual power or well, whatever that was. Well, he's able to was. have relationships with, you know, his girlfriends, and he's got a boyfriend, too. And, it's, you know, I just, there may be a little bit of a component of sex addiction here. Because there's also, you know, all the assaults, and everything is very sexually related. But he can separate, like, until he murders you. Unless you're Nadia, you know? No, oh, it's you, it's hard to pin him down. No, there's a can't. lot going he's, on here. He's a, he's a lot, and he, from, from the start, you know, I mean, from eight years old, it, you're just... Yeah. 
he's all over the place. And then by, you know, 13 and 14, he's already, like, violently reacting and and sexually assaulting people, which is something that is learned, you know. And it, there's just, you feel bad for him. But then, it, you know, there's moments where with Kareen's murder, you're just like, okay, no, I I can't let you do this. And then I feel bad for you, you know. Yeah, he's definitely all over the place. He's erratic. He's a wild card. And there's a lot going on here. And like I said before, I know that a lot of this stems from trauma that's untreated and the violence that was inflicted on him. But he's still ultimately responsible for getting treatment and getting better. You know, people know that they're not supposed to murder and rape other people. So, I mean, I feel bad that he went through that as a kid, but there's so many people that don't go on to commit these crimes or get the treatment that they need or whatever it is, and he's just out there really running amok, doing whatever he wants, using people, and just taking care of himself and in a most violent way fashion, indulging his worst impulses. Yeah. Police found a packed bag where Sid was staying and a ticket to Madrid, Spain on his person at the time of his arrest in Portugal. From Madrid, he planned to fly to the Canary Islands with his boyfriend Armando, where he was, where he believed he could start a new life and leave the trains and his crimes behind. Police ran with the theory that Nadia breaking up with Sid and the violence that followed were not coincidental. Sid agreed to an interview with a reporter from the French magazine Le Figaro. He confessed to his crimes openly, laying them out in great detail. Sid said that he had seen Isabel before they got on the train at the Limoges station, where they small-talked for a few minutes. Later, at about 3 a.m., he'd been smoking a joint in a mostly empty train car when he saw Isabel again, and he kind of started chatting her up. She asked him if she could use his phone to call her boyfriend, who she was headed home to see. When Isabel had a few drags of the joint he was smoking, he said that he had a flash vision of him killing her, and he was compelled to follow through with this vision. Then he grabbed her and threw her off the train, recalling, quote, there was nothing I could do. When that happens, you aren't even aware of all the blood you spill. I got her and chased her and threw her off the train. Horrific. Unbelievable. I can't even. It's the visual, right? Of him chasing her and grabbing her and throwing her. Chasing her. She's running from him. She's she sees him coming. She's afraid. He's chasing her to physically grab to toss her out a window off a train. There's just. This is a horror movie, like beyond horror. And him explaining it himself is just disgusting. Yeah. He said that he had met Emily Bazan through her friends when he was selling hash at the University of Armenians. They became friends. Sid said that he thought she was sweet and that, quote, they really hit it off. They dated off and on, and he claimed that he knew Emily had also been dating two other guys, one of which he didn't like, and he killed her to, quote, avenge her boyfriend. Whatever you got to tell yourself. I don't even want to say it's delusions. I just, it's excuses, but they're not even really logical excuses. It just doesn't make any sense. It's just words. Yeah, it's just empty bullshit. He's being interviewed by a reporter. He said he didn't know he was going to kill her until he actually did it. And this time he had a vision of her dead. And as if it was a direct order to him, he had no choice but to follow through with it. 
Sid claims that there were at least three people he knew of that had seen Emily's body in the cellar, but they hadn't told anyone, which he speculates is because they were protecting him. I don't know if I believe that, but it is a little interesting. I don't believe it at all. Thank you. Okay. I'm like, I'm going to just, you know, be the ad, whatever. People are going to come out of the water. Oh, Courtney is so, no, I don't think so either, but. Just checking. It just really, really doesn't make sense. Makes no sense whatsoever. It's just another thing that he's just kind of talking shit. It really sounds like he's, in a weird way, not showing off, but I don't even know what the right way to put it is. I mean, he's just kind of making up these stories to make himself look like he's in a more positive light. You know, oh, if people are looking out for me and they want to protect me, then I'm a good guy. Mm, And, you know, that's funny. That's funny that you think that because I immediately am looking at it that he's, well, other people saw she was dead and they never said anything. So it's not just my fault. Oh, yeah. Totally from that side of it. That Not that anyone's really protecting him, but oh, they must not have said anything because they were protecting me. But they saw it too. And you're not interviewing them. I mean, they could have called the cop. You know what I mean? Like trying to toss a little bit of this aside. To other yeah, people. minimize the guilt, what he right? did. Yeah, totally. That's what that's what I took from it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, both of them make sense. And None he's really fucked sense. up. It's probably both of it. All of it's real. It's all true. <laughs> it's all of it. Yeah, it's everything. <laughs> According to Sid, Corinne Cayo's murder had been, quote, sheer madness. He recalled that he saw her and followed her into the bathroom and he was just planning at first to steal her purse. Again, this is something that I don't believe because robbery was never a motive for any of these. So that just doesn't make sense. He would never up front just, oh, steal. I mean, he has, you know, records where it was pickpocketing, you know, it was stuff like that. It was sneaky things. It wasn't like the only people that he ever held a knife to their throat kind of thing was like assaulting a man, you know, multiple times of that. But very rarely right. was he just not putting a woman in a bathroom and taking her purse. It was crimes of opportunity and just quick and like easy and easy out kind of stuff. So I don't believe this either. He also claims that he hadn't seen the baby in the stroller and that if he had, he wouldn't have killed her. Bullshit. Yeah, exactly. And of course, this is just great to say now, but she also had her dog with her and he knew that detail. So it seems really unlikely that he didn't see a big ass stroller with a child in it. If he saw the dog, he saw these other details. He's not going to miss the kid. This claim is probably really just him trying to make himself and the reporter think that he's not that bad of a monster this whole interview, like oh i wouldn't have done it if i knew about the kid or whatever this whole interview is just damage control and trying to soften sharp edges of the story absolutely when you place a wager with william hill sportsbook every sports moment becomes even more interesting and we have a special offer to help you bet on all your favorite sports risk-free Download the William Hill mobile app, and when you sign up, you can get started with a risk-free bet of up to $500. Use promo code RADIORF. Must be present in New Jersey. 21 plus only. Terms and conditions apply. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit 800gambler.org. Let's make it interesting with William Hill Sportsbook. Welcome to Bob! What makes Moe's Moe's? Well, outside of our warm and unique welcome, some would say our burritos, like our legendary homewrecker. Others, our famous queso. Everyone would say our free chips and salsa, which are made fresh every day. Here at Moe's, it doesn't matter if you're a first-timer or long-timer. At Moe's, you're family. And when you're hungry and in a hurry, Moe's online ordering makes it easy. Order ahead through Moe's.com or the Moe's app and choose in-store pickup or delivery. After the murder, he had blood all over him and said that he wrapped his shirt around his arm, hoping that no one would see it. He told the reporter that during his murder spree, he was drinking two liters of Jack Daniels a day, smoking weed, and taking LSD. The day the warrant was issued, Sid took one million francs, 
10 kilos of weed and a gun and then fled to Barcelona. He ended the interview by saying, quote, May God help all their families and bring misery down on me. If someone had done that to someone from my family, I would have killed them, torn out their heart, and eaten it. The Sid Rizala case is considered to be one of the most bungled murder investigations in the history of French policing. He was being held in the maximum care unit and receiving medical treatment while in custody. Corrections officers noticed that he'd been declining mentally as the September extradition to France was growing closer, describing that he was showing signs of extreme despair and anxiety. Sid had made several suicide attempts while in the Lisbon psychiatric prison, slashing his arms and neck with a razor in March, but the guards dismissed these saying that he was, quote, attention-seeking. What kind of psychiatric facility workers are these that are saying that people that are cutting themselves and self-harming are attention-seeking? It just makes me livid. How did he get it's the razor? Just, that, yeah, that's the other thing, is huh? how did he even have access to these instruments to hurt himself? And on top of that, you're just dismissing this person that's clearly a danger to themselves. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know how to describe how I'm feeling right now. Yeah. It's really unbelievable that these are mental health care professionals, that these are officers designed to work with people that are in mental health facility. I don't know how they don't have the training or the knowledge to understand what's really going on here. And they don't have the procedures in place to make sure that their patients slash inmates don't have access to any sort of tools to harm themselves. This is just severely shocking. On June 29th, 2000, A year to the day since he'd previously been released from prison and returned to Nadia, he was left alone in his cell. That morning, he was treated for self-inflicted cuts to his wrists, and the doctor informed the staff that he might make another attempt in the next 24 hours, and he needed to be closely monitored. Three hours later, he blocked the door with a metal bar from his bed. Using a cigarette lighter, he set fire to the mattress. Again, how did he get a lighter in addition to razors? What the fuck is going on in this facility? They're handing them out. Oh, man. Because the mattress was fireproof, it really didn't actually catch fire. But it did make a bunch of smoke and noxious fumes and it smelled terrible. And it's just unbelievable to me that not only was he able to get these items and start a fire, but nobody actually noticed. There was smoke, there was fumes, it smelled, and no one noticed. Yeah. My note was, How does a smoke-heavy fire start inside a building and no one notices? It makes no sense. Things that make you go, What the fuck "Hmm." is going on here? Yeah, I got questions. But we're going to answer how no one notices. So, yeah, the thing that was going on this day was the guards were just completely distracted because they were watching the Euro 2000 soccer game semifinal between France and Portugal in another room. So they were not following the doctor's warnings that Sid needed to be closely monitored. By the time the guards finally got to the cell to check on Sid, they discovered that they couldn't get the door open. When they were finally able to open the door, the guards found that Sid had already asphyxiated to death. His attorney said it was, quote, surprising that somebody is able to set fire to his cell without being seen or heard. 
We are all very sad that a boy of 21 has died in this way. To us, it does not mean he was guilty. The families of the murdered women were overcome with anger and, of course, saddened that there would be no closure to the cases of their loved ones' murders. This really denied them a lot of that healing that comes from getting justice and seeing the whole process through. So it's just maddening to me that this facility failed so severely that this person lost their life and so many people were denied the opportunity to truly have that closure they needed to move on. Clearly, Sid was a very disturbed person that did harm to many people, and that's just unforgivable, but he really should have never had access to any of these things that could be used to hurt himself or others. He could have just as easily used any of those things to hurt another inmate. He could have attacked someone. He could have had more victims, you know? Yeah, and it seems like the doctors were warning them, saying, you know, this guy might need a little extra watch. Just make sure you're you're watching this guy, right? And that just was not enough. It's just another reason for me to hate sports. Let's leave it at that. There you go. <laughs> That's what we'll take away from this. It's just another reason for Brianna to hate sports. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, I don't know, you hear these stories of the failings of corrections officers or times that people aren't paying attention and that's when shit happens. And I understand that you can't have one officer per every inmate to just sit there and stare at them. I understand. But these routine checks every 10 minutes or something, so they're making the rounds and checking every cell or whatever, those absolutely have to happen so that people don't have the opportunity to do these things that could not only lead to the loss of their own life, but if that fire would have worked, for example, who knows who else could have gotten hurt. It's just, it's dangerous and it it could lead to people being hurt or dying. And it's just not fair that these people decided a game of soccer was more important than people's lives. Yeah, this was definitely a bungled situation, kind of from the start to the finish. And it's it's kind of hard because you can't necessarily blame one thing because so many things went wrong. Oh, yeah. But everything that could go wrong pretty much went wrong, Yeah, I would pretty say. Much. Pretty much. It just blows my mind that, you know, from... The French police, the rail workers, Portuguese police, and then the facility that he was being kept in, like everybody fucked up. The it's fact just that he terrible. Was, he was arrested and like his, you know, I was going to say his plates were run, but like his info, you know, his his information, his driver's license is what I'm trying to say, was ran and they had this info and... Interpol, you know, had his info. And again, it's like the last three, all these railroad episodes have the same thing in common, which is this person's on the run. They're like one step ahead. And the computer system is always a little behind. Right. Every single time. <laughs> it's like, well, we had or him the at, human computer system. <laughs> yes, we had him at one o'clock and then we let him go because he wasn't in the system. And at three o'clock he got in the system. So sorry, we fucked up. But it's not our fault because at one o'clock he wasn't in the system. It's it's this backwards, you know, just circular logic. And it's happened in every single one. And these guys are just always one step ahead, you know, just one train depot further than they need to be. Right. <laughs> and it's that is kind of how these railroad ones have worked is that they're literally one step ahead. Yes, because they're always on the move. There's always this lack of communication between whatever area they're in or the different departments because the railroads are separate from the actual police stations. Nobody's talking to each other. Everybody's having trouble keeping up with this person, this suspect that's moving very quickly. And 
this case is just failure upon failure. I'd like to believe that everybody was doing their best, but it just, it's hard to look at something like this and say that it's okay that this kind of stuff happened because he could have been caught earlier. People could have been safer. I mean, if he was held more accountable for some of his violent crimes, maybe he wouldn't have been out on the street to murder people. If they would have caught him sooner when he presented his ID with no ticket, then maybe he wouldn't have been able to murder another person. There's just so many times that people's lives could have been saved and they failed at every corner. And that's just really hard to accept. There's also this little bit of it where when you're dealing with transit, people have to be somewhere. These trains are on a schedule and you can't stop for anything short of someone being murdered on the train. So let's say that you find this guy, right? And he's got a ticket. Well, we can't stop. Like, this isn't a big enough deal. This is just a guy without a ticket on the train, as far as they know, right? So they just keep going. And they just, you know, whatever. It's not a big deal. It's not a big party. Oh, whatever. Just get him on the train at the next station. We got to keep going. We got to keep moving. And that is another thing that helps them in all of these cases is like the thing that they're using has to be somewhere at a certain time. So as long as... They're just kind of flying underneath, whatever, just hitching a ride on. They're going to make at least to that place at the right time. You know, whatever it is, they can depend on that at their very least, right? So there's just a lot of times like they catch them on the train and it's it's just easier, whatever, just we got a schedule to keep because I'm sure they get docked. They get in trouble if they don't make it in time, right? So there's a lot of things going on and they take full advantage of it all. There's a lot of things working against the detectives and police and different authorities in these railroad cases. It's still just frustrating to watch from the outside, seeing how these these railroad killers just slip through the cracks, you know? Yeah. Okay. So I think that's pretty much it. That's it. For railroad killers, letter R, I think we're done. Close the book. (laughs) So, yeah, before we get out of here, let's remind you that we've got links to our resources if you want to do more reading. We've got resources for self-help kind of stuff, resources for domestic violence, suicide prevention, 12-step, all sorts of stuff like that in the show notes every week. We also have links to our Threadless for merch And we have the link for our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and the link for our Patreon. So if you go to patreon.com slash murder dictionary podcast, you can support the show and in turn get ad-free episodes, bonus content, and a bunch of perks and stuff like that. Before we skedaddle, we just want to say thank you to the people that joined our Patreon this time, which are Jennifer, Cheryl, Melanie, Casey, Meg, and Will. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, you guys. We really, really appreciate you. And we love that you're supporting the show. And we appreciate you being on our Patreon. So I think that's pretty much it. We're ready to get out of here until next time. So you guys have a great week. Stay safe. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode. We'll catch you on the letter T. No, S. Where am I? Catch you (laughs) on the letter S. Oh, I do that so often. For someone with a podcast named Murder Dictionary, I really should be better at the alphabet. (laughs) Yeah, we should be better a lot at the alphabet. All right, everybody. Uh, We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Welcome to Moe's. What makes Moe's Moe's? Well, outside of our warm and unique welcome, some would say our burritos, like our legendary homewrecker. Others, our famous queso. Everyone would say our free chips and salsa, which are made fresh every day. Here at Moe's, it doesn't matter if you're a first-timer or long-timer. At Moe's, you're family. And when you're hungry and in a hurry, Moe's online ordering makes it easy. Order ahead through Moe's.com or the Moe's app and choose in-store pickup or delivery. 
At NJM Insurance, making our customers happy is what makes us number one. J.D. Power ranked us first in the nation for customer satisfaction with the auto insurance claims experience. Get award-winning service at NJM.com. This isn't just insurance. It's NJM.